Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Living Room, where we listen, learn, and live together. I'm your host, Richard Martin, and I am so glad that you have chosen to spend this time with me and our special guest together. I hope your week's been going well. I want to thank you for your listenership and for following us and supporting this mission, where we believe that a simple conversation can have a profound impact on your life. You know, when I was growing up, my mother always emphasized the value of serving the forgotten, the underrepresented, and the marginalized. She often took us with her on personal family missions of service. So as I look back over my life, service has left an indelible impression upon my outlook on life. What about you? Well, today I'm excited to invite our special guest to the living room. She is a young agent of change who uses her passion for service and persevering spirit to inspire and transform. Janice Dickerson is a graduate of Oakwood University, which is, in my humble opinion, one of the best institutions in the land. She's a graduate of the University of New England and is currently pursuing, quite successfully, her PhD in organizational leadership from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. She stands on the so excuse me, she stands on the shoulders of many who have come before her. And in my personal opinion and observation, she's doing a phenomenal job. Would you help me welcome to the living room, Miss Janice Dickerson? What's going on? Hey, you make me sound real good over there. <laughs> I'm just I'm just reading the facts. Just reading the facts. <laughs> thank you so much for being willing to hang out today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Now, they tell me, I'm a Florida boy. I, I come from the East Coast. They mm -hmm. tell me that the West Coast is the best coast. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the East Coast right now. You're on the West Coast. Can you validate that? Has that been your experience? What's been going on with you out there? I can. I mean, they didn't lie to you. The West okay. Coast is definitely the best coast. Yeah, it's okay. hot out here right now. Um, so that's not great, but, <laughs> um, it's been good. I, I go to work, you know, I do simply and I do school work. That's kind of, kind of what I'm doing over here right now. How long have you been in Cali? Well, I'm from here. Okay. Um, I'm from San Bernardino, California. Um, I moved back in 2017 after I finished my master's. So it's been three, three years now since I've been back. Yeah. So it's All different right. as an adult. Really? Yes, it's completely different. I'm living a completely different life as an adult, yeah. Okay, awesome. I don't know why I had you born and raised somewhere further back east, but okay, born and raised in California. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably just the Oakwood connection. Everyone thinks I'm from everywhere else, but from where I'm from. It's crazy. Mercy. Yeah, I always get the east or even the north sometimes. No one thinks I'm from. <laughs> the West Coast. <laughs> now, did you go back West because it's home or was it more academic opportunity, work opportunities after Oakwood? Um, I came back because I had more resources out here and I just wanted to get out of Huntsville. So it just made more sense for me at the time. Okay. And what'd you study at Oakwood? Um, social work. Wow. Now, mm -hmm. I always thought when we were at Oakwood, and this was, you know, very probably elementary, um, assumption on my part that anybody who came to Oakwood or just college in general, when they took up a major, that that was rooted in some deep passion that I had been thinking about and brooding over since I was five. And then I came to find out that some people were just in school because their parents said, you got to go to school. They looked at, you know, the school handbook and closed their eyes, picked something and then went with it. Was that you or did you more so pursue social work from a place of passion from an interest that was lodged in your experience or observation, or was it at the wisdom of somebody who counseled you and says, based on your personality, I think you would do well here? Um, initially, it was not because of any kind of passion. Um, I went to college days and I was debating between social work and psychology and the social work department did an excellent presentation and just won me over. Um, thankfully, I chose the right field. <laughs> um, I couldn't see myself doing anything else. And later on, I realized that, you know, God let me on this path for a reason. I didn't just pick it to pick it, even though that's what I thought <laughs> I was doing. Okay. Phenomenal. Yeah. Well, a huge uh, shout out and virtual applause to whoever put on <laughs> that college days presentation. 
it made a difference in the life of at least one young lady and I know in the lives of so many others. So as I was introducing you, I shared that you are successfully pursuing <laughs> your PhD in organizational leadership, but I, I believe that a PhD is just as rigorous as I'm sure the description on the websites of PhDs everywhere say they are. What's your experience been like in this 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 lane or this season in your graduate work? Um, for me, it's been completely different because I'm so used to social work. So like my master's, that's all I did was social work courses. So it was kind of a breeze for me um, because it was what I was interested in. Organizational leadership is all business and um, a bit of psychology. And I have no knowledge <laughs> in any of those fields. So it's definitely um, forced me to really just like, like I'm starting undergrad again, like you're coming in brand new, you don't know much at all. Um, I'm learning a whole lot. It is hard, um, but it's school. So I don't know, I can do school. So for me, it's just, if you present the information correctly or well, then I can, I can do the schoolwork. Um, but the, um, the hardest hard part has been my dissertation. That's been the hardest part, working on that part, yeah. So you're in the dissertation writing phase right now? So I've started it. They have a course where you have, um, where you can only work on your dissertation. And then from here on out, it's kind of you working on it on your own. So just balancing your classes and your dissertation has been hard because you don't get much direction. You know, you have your chair and you can always reach out to them, but it's, it's hard, you know, you're lost a lot of the time. <laughs> so, now, yeah. without going into too much detail mm -hmm. or going into as much detail as you feel comfortable, can you share with us what your research focus is? Yeah, so I am researching um, emancipated foster youth in their transition into adulthood. Um, so I work with a lot of foster youth in the hospital. I see a lot of kids come and go, especially teenagers. Um, I also see them age out of the system. And a lot of kids, they, they don't know the benefits of staying in foster care because you can stay in until like you're 21 and you can receive a lot of benefits. But because they've been in this system that they feel like it's just held them down and it's trapped them, they wanna just break out. So they emancipate at 18 years old. And after that, they end up homeless or pregnant or you know, just doing a lot of criminal activity. Um, and so my research is focusing on the leadership aspect of that and what leaderships, what leaders are or are not doing to help them transition just a little smoothly or, or just better. And does that come from your work in the social work field? Yeah, so I had foster sisters growing up. I had um, four foster sisters and then um, working in the hospital, just working with a lot of foster kids. I love, they have my heart. I love the foster kids um, and I love youth. Um, and I hate, youth are forgotten in the foster system. Um, and so I think that's kind of drawn me towards them and just wanted me to help them excel in life. So, yeah. I think that's profound. From my understanding, there can be a lot of myths and misunderstandings about the foster care system. Mm -hmm. um, there is on one end of the spectrum, the very typecast and stereotypical understanding that I think is lodged in a, a relative degree of ignorance that anyone who's involved in it, particularly adults or parents, are seeking to get some kind of you know, monetary advantage to life. And then there are the stories on the other end of the spectrum where and I have friends and, and even mentors who, whose lives were completely transformed positively because a kind, loving family brought them in and they root every profoundly important foundation in their life to that. And then I'm sure there's a lot of in between. And you know there might be some truth to one thing, some error or, or, or fallacy to the other. Based on your experience, you mentioned growing up with four foster sisters. Is there still a relationship? Was that just a phase of your life and you don't know where they are? What was that like for you? Did you kind of at first resist it or is it all that you knew and you were fine with it? So I don't know if I resisted initially, I was younger. Um, I don't have any contact with any of them. I had my first two sisters, um, after they were 18, they decided to just leave and go out on their own. So after that, we didn't really hear from them. And then my second set of sisters, I actually saw one in the hospital <laughs> not too long ago, which was crazy because I hadn't seen her in 
years since I was younger and she recognized me. I would have, I wouldn't have ever recognized her. Um, but we, we don't keep in contact or anything like that. They kind of, once they got older, they kind of just went on their own. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that moment was filled with a lot of different emotions. Um, yeah, it was crazy. I didn't know what to do. And it was a little awkward because I didn't know who she was at first. She was like, you don't remember me. And, but it was, it was good to just see her and to just, you know, like you grew up with her kind of. So it was good. But those myths are not wrong. Um, some people do take in kids just for money. Um, I learned, I've learned a lot working in the hospital. You have medically fragile kids, which are kids with underlying medical conditions. And they, um, you receive so much more money for those kids. So we get a lot of parents who want the kids on all kinds of machines and medicines and stuff, because the more they're on, the more money they get. But you also do have parents who just who want to take care of a child and who want to just love on a child and you know just help somebody get out of the system so i think like everything there's there's good and bad to it um but i think a lot of people more so leans to lean towards that bad and mostly it's good i'm not sure if you've heard of or seen this movie it's fairly new with mark Wahlberg called instant family I it's have. a pretty yeah. interesting comedy but it's a comedy in genre but the focal point is very serious and it's not so much foster care as much as adoption but there I think are some overlapping themes and the premise of it is there's this loving kind couple who wants to in take in three siblings and from my understanding that's not a guarantee that if you are biologically related you are guaranteed to go into the same home and so they highlight that and so the eldest sibling said, you know, it's one, it's all of us or none of us, basically. And she knew what the system was like. So they yeah. said, we'll take everybody. And it's like a five-year-old, 10-year-old, and she was maybe 15. Mm -hmm. And so, again, without telling the movie or going into much detail, there was this constant tension between the ideals and the, the motives of the parents, but then also the suspicion of the children based on their experiences, some trauma. So in your experience, how have you, and this is blending in your work as a social worker, this is your current studies, your work in the hospital, what steps and approaches are you finding are working for childhood adverse traumatic experiences for those in the foster care system or just in general for young people? Um, that's hard to answer because every kid is different. And so I have um, friends who, they're a couple and they've taken in three foster kids now. They're, all the kids are different. One is a black boy, one is you have um, a very, uh, a white boy and a Hispanic baby. And they're Hispanic and white. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like instant family, like how everybody's just, it's just a big rainbow in that house. Um, and they've had to approach every child differently because each child comes with that extra trauma, you know? Um, each child has had different experiences and honestly you just have to love on these kids and you have to be patient with them like that's those are the the two main components that are crucial for their growth and for their um, just coming out of what they're used to you know especially when you get older kids they've already been through life and they're very suspicious they're not trusting of you um, they don't know your intentions and so you just have to be very patient. You have to be consistent with showing them love. You can't one day, you know, be upset with them and punish them and this and that. And then the next day, try to love on them. Like you have to be very consistent. Um, and really just catering to the needs that come up as they come. Because you can have a child for three months and they may start acting out after the third month. And you're like thinking you had this perfect child. Um, but now you have to take steps into trying to figure out what, what's the issue, taking them to therapy, you know, putting that work in. So honestly, if you're not willing to put in that work, I don't think you should take in the foster kid. Wow. So at a certain point in your academic journey, you begin to pursue in a very intentional way, a certain path of service. Yeah. You have a nonprofit organization that I would like you to introduce us to it. What is it and how did it begin? So Simply Service is a nonprofit that I started after I completed my master's degree. Um, basically, we just go out and serve any way we can. We do a lot of different things. We 
people know us for our blessing bags because that's how I started. Um, but we also do a Mother's Day event every Mother's Day um, at a women's shelter out here. We also go and have a game night at a teen shelter. You know, I try to do different components of service to try to show that you don't have to spend a lot of time, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, you just need to go out and serve. But I started it after I finished my master's program. And I was in Huntsville. And while I was in Huntsville, I was working two jobs. So I didn't have a lot of time to just go out and do what I'm doing now. Um, I worked at a daycare and I was a bereavement counselor for kids. So when I went home, I did my schoolwork and I, I went to bed. That was kind of my schedule. Um, but I just started to have like this desire to serve. Like I just really wanted to get out into my community. And one day I was on Facebook and I saw a post of a lady putting a bunch of stuff in a purse and handing it out to the homeless. And I feel like I was like a little cartoon with a light bulb over my head and I was like, this is perfect, I can do this. Um, so I started to get Ziploc bags. I started to fill them with basic hygiene items and snacks. I put them in my car and every time I just drove to work and I saw someone like on the corner or wherever, I would hand out the bag. And so that's kind of how my, just serving my consistent, you know, keeping myself consistent in serving, that's how it started. Um, it continued with me after I noticed like, okay, this is like something that I can do. I want to do something more. I'm a big dreamer. I don't like to do things that I feel are small. <laughs> so um, I decided to do a back to school um, event or not an event, but get back to school supplies for a, a group home in Huntsville. And so I just made a little flyer. Now that I look at that flyer, it was a horrible looking flyer. And I put it on Facebook and I asked for donations and people just started sending me money. And I thought it was crazy. I'm like, why do you guys trust me with your money? But people just started sending me money. And um, I got this group home. It was like a group home of like uh, 15 kids. I got them all their own backpacks, little supplies. I got them snacks for the school year and a lot of hygiene supplies because these were things that they said that they needed. And after that, there was just like no stopping me at that point. I was like, oh, I can do this. So let's keep going. I also like to do things in my own way. So I didn't want to volunteer at a food kitchen. I didn't want to volunteer at a food pantry, even though those are great things to do. I just wanted to do something on my own time um, in the way I wanted to do it. So that's kind of how I started Simply. <laughs> So simply, for those who might be listening and thinking of the spelling in its more traditional way, it is S-I-M-P-L-I. -I. Yes. Why that change? So I put an I because as I was continuing to serve, I realized that you have to start with yourself. You can't rely on another organization and you can't rely on just other people to get you out to serve. Um, it needs to be something within you that gets you out there and and to serve basically. So that's why I made it an I. I thought it was very important to emphasize that we just can't rely on everybody to do things for us. So we like to give donations and not really put in the work and change can't really be made if you don't start with yourself. So that's why. <laughs> that's a profound statement. Wow. Change cannot really happen if you don't begin with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that that posture, that heart posture is somewhat of a departure from how our generation and maybe the generations coming up after us, millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, you know, there are always these characterizations. The millennials are this, 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 and that, that, that. And one of them is that we are self-interested and self-seeking. We, we have a distrust of established institutions. Um, and sometimes even a distrust of authority, you know, that there's not as ingrained a loyalty and on and on, all these kinds of, you know, bullet points, whenever you think of a millennial, books have been written on it, right? And I'm not here to debate that as much as I am to say, your emphasis on coming outside of yourself and your emphasis on the I, not in a self-seeking way, but on the I in terms of beginning with oneself for change outside of oneself, that seems to be a departure from how our generation is characterized. So my question is, first of all, would you say I have not always been concerned about other people? So it is, is it something that is a growth point for you? 
And how can those in our generation and really now expanding in any generation who feels like most of your time is about getting yours. Most of your energy is about being about you. Uh, most of your money and et cetera, et cetera, is invested in you. How can we make that shift to start thinking about and actively pursuing service for others? So for your first question, I, I think that I've always cared for others. I've always wanted to do for others. Um, that I is just so that I can be more intentional about it. Um, especially when I, like when I started Simply, it was very much um, me wanting people to join my organization. And I want you to volunteer with me. And I want to be the one to save everybody. I don't want to, you know, partner with people and I don't want to do these things. Um, and later on, I realized that the change that I'm trying to make and the growth in communities that I'm trying to, you know, push, it can't happen if you're worried about your recognition, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, I think just being intentional about um, your purpose and, you know, you can, you can start with yourself and you can, um, it can start with whatever you want to do, but as long as that's that outpouring is onto somebody else, I don't think it really makes a big difference, honestly. I think because the end result is is a positive end result. You know, does that make sense? It does. It does. <laughs> I think the emphasis on collaboration is very relevant for the times in which we're yeah. living. And as a pastor, I see it a lot where I think as a human being, we all feel that impulse to accomplish and be affirmed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. I think that's how we grow. That's how we are. We receive knowledge that we're on the right path, affirmation. But it can be intoxicating and it can be misleading and it can become uh, somewhat isolating so that if I share the light with enough people, then there's not enough on me. But man, that's, that, that's out of the window at this day and age where collaboration really does have a chance to propel us all forward. So I love that insight. Let me ask you this, as you've been conversing with and engaging with persons of who are in different situations in life in your service initiatives, what have you learned from them? I've just learned that we just need to be kind. <laughs> we just need to be kind people. I, I feel like I have this big thing right now where like, I just want everyone to act as a decent human being. Um, and that's just being kind and just showing love in all that you do. Um, I've had like this journey with like God and everything and the whole conclusion that I've come with when it comes to like serving or just living or just being a Christian is that we just have to love on people, you know, like just showing any hate or anything that's outside of love. It's, it's, it can be very detrimental to people. And you never know with you never know who you're going to come into contact with. You never know what a small gesture could do for somebody's entire day. Um, so just constantly showing love, being intentional about being kind. I, I think that's key to doing anything and to, to just being a decent person. <laughs> so in your opinion, why then do people hate? I saw a post recently and there were a number of senior citizens who said in so many words, they can't believe we're still arguing about some items in the national conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is the ongoing presence of prejudice and racism and discrimination. Why is there still hate in the hearts of people? I think it's a lot of it is ignorance um, and just what we're taught growing up. Honestly, we're very self-centered people as humans um, and if things don't benefit us directly, I think that causes a lot of backlash. Um, but ignorance, I feel like education can just, <laughs> once you're educated and you know better, you know, you have to do better, you know? So I feel like a lot of it is, is true ignorance and, and just being so selfish that you don't want to be open to anything being different than what you which you already, you know, have instilled in you. Do you recall any particularly life-changing conversations or interactions that you've had while leading Simply Service? Um, uh, in terms of like that topic or just in general? In general. Yeah, I mean, so when I first started um, making my blessing bags, um, there was a guy that I passed almost like 
daily because I took the same path to work, you know, and he was on the corner daily. So every day I would give him a bag or every time I had a bag, I would give him a bag. And one day he stopped me and he just thanked me and he was like, I really appreciate, you know, you giving these bags out to me like almost daily because it helps me to know where, how I'm going to wash up that day or, you know, what I'm going to do for food and so on and so forth. And honestly, that's what kept me going because I didn't feel like I was doing anything. I mean, I'm handing out like socks and soap and crackers, you know, um, and I didn't feel like it was really making a difference, but that just showed me like, you, you just never know. And you don't have to, you don't, it doesn't always have to be a big gesture, you know, to really impact somebody or to help someone get through their day. It can be, it can truly be something simple. I love how service is transformative for the recipients, but then also for those who are on the giving end. Yeah. And I get in many ways why, and this is coming from a, a Christian bias, a biblical bias. I get why Jesus would say, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Mm -hmm. And the emphasis to be very cautious about the amount of publicity or really the motive of publicity when it comes to service. So we live in a, a tech age where anything from anywhere with a simple hashtag can be blasted around the world in seconds. Yeah. And I think that much good has been done as a result of that. For instance, mm -hmm. a lot of the civil rights movement that's going on right now has been propelled by the powerful use and stewardship of social media. Mm -hmm. However, we also know that at times things can become very, you know, narrow in terms of, okay, who is this really about? Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate your emphasis on really not always trusting the analytics or the front page so that I'm sure there are stories for days that you all have and things that you've done in places that if there was a crew of camera persons coming around you all the time, yeah. simply service and what you've done might be a you know national headline and that day might come and I hope it does in all honesty but I think it helps us all from a human standpoint to know that I guess within us there is two sides of every coin there's the one that's purely selfless we just want everyone to be well but then there's also something that says you know but I don't mind if if mm -hmm. you kind of look my way yeah. And it's always kind of, I don't know if you'll ever get away from one or the other completely, but just being mindful of it from a day-to-day -day basis. So I love that, that you might not know when you're making a difference or people might not come to you after the difference is made and applaud you, congratulate you, even them. I love that he was able to have that moment to interact with you, to give you a sense of, hey, I appreciate you. Um, and so there's this internal external relationship where you have to know just from the inside, I know why I'm doing it and I might not ever hear it or no one might ever come and say, hey, you're doing the right thing. But from the inside, I'm convinced. And then the right person at the right time will come and say, we see you. Yeah. And you have to remind yourself about, I have to remind myself all the time because you know, like you can follow simply on Instagram and everything, but I don't post often. <laughs> Doesn't mean we're not always doing something. And for me, that's kind of like, oh, how are we going to grow if I'm not always posting? But that gets in the way of what I'm really trying to do. Um, and, and again, I sometimes I'm just like, you want to put everything out there because you want people to see what you're doing. But I, I always have to check myself, like, why are you doing this? Are you doing this to be seen or are you doing this to truly try to help people? And honestly, like when you need to be seen, you will be seen and you're you know, your work will be shown and, you know, whatever the case may be when it, when that time is necessary. But I just being intentional, we're human. And, you know, having that balance between wanting to be seen and doing things and being selfless, it's, it's something that you have to navigate on a daily basis, honest and truly, because as selfless as I can be, I can also, and as I don't even like to be in the limelight, but sometimes I just want somebody to say, good job, <laughs> you know, and to know you're not always going to get that. And you can't, that can't be your motivator and you can't move off of that reassurance because then you'll never be consistent and work like this. I heard an interview from attorney Brian Stevenson. Many persons might not know that name, but they might be more familiar with the movie Just Mercy starring Michael B. Jordan, which I think exposed a large portion of our population to 
uh, the work that Brian Stevenson and the Equality and Justice Initiative has been doing. Mm -hmm. I use this as a kind of a segue from our last thought that you might not always be known or, or, or be seen and your work might not garner national attention. So attorney Brian Stevenson has been working for mm -hmm. against mass incarceration, um, excessive punitive measures mm -hmm. and racial injustice for three decades. Mm -hmm. And now a movie is just coming out. Now his name is grown. He's been in the South since he graduated from law school. And I went and followed them on Instagram, Equal Justice Initiative, his page. I don't even know if he has two pictures posted, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Equal Justice Initiative page is not, it doesn't have a lot of posts. People are now gaining interest and awareness of it. But what was profound to me is that his work preceded the recognition. His work was consistent and meaningful and impactful, even when it was just the family who received their loved one back again. Yeah. You know, and so it is sobering. And, and I love the point that you made because it humanizes us all mm -hmm. that as selfless as we can be, you catch me on the right day and I can be all about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, you're right. It takes a daily effort to navigate that from a faith perspective. We know that God is helping us with that. Um, for those persons who aren't there yet, it takes your community, persons who can say, you know, all right, don't forget where you came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we also live in a day and age where you, if you didn't show it, it didn't happen. Mm. You know? So it's hard. It's really, I feel like it's harder for us. I always say, I wish I was born like in a time when there was no social media. I would thrive <laughs> because it puts so much pressure on you to just always want to or feel the need to show what you're doing. You know, so it doesn't help. It doesn't help. Yeah. And as much as like people... I feel like as much as people say they don't care about social media and all of those things, I mean, when you have like something you're trying to do and something that you want to be known, you do feel that pressure and that need to always show everybody everything. <laughs> and it can be such an interesting internal struggle, especially yeah. in the arena of service, asking yourself, should I take this picture? Should I post this picture? That's real. Very awkward. Like, hey, can we get a picture together? Because you never know how that's going to come off and you don't want that to be misperceived or misinterpreted. So, oh, you're just here for the photo op. Yeah. And I think it's, so for me, I don't, you won't see a lot of pictures of the people we come into contact with on my page. Just because I'm not comfortable saying, can I take a picture of you? Because I feel like it just takes away from what you're doing now if i'm sitting having a conversation a full conversation with someone and we talk and we develop some kind of some relationship or whatever then i might be a little more comfortable saying um do you mind if i share your story um it's also about your wording it's also your wording is very important that was well said by the way <laughs> if you were to ask me that i'd be like yes what do you yeah. want to know? <laughs> but you can't say do you mind if i share your story if all you've done is hand them a bag and walked away Wow. You know, so um, just kind of balancing that as well. Like when, when is it appropriate? Um, when is it not appropriate? You know, just in, engaging the attitude of that person. Like um, the other day we had the opportunity to pay someone's electric bill. Um, and I asked her, I said, do you mind sending me a picture of you? And I told her why I told her um, it helps us to get word out of what we're doing and so on and so forth. But I felt, as I'm talking, I'm like, I kept saying, if you don't want to, it's okay. <laughs> it's okay, you know, because you do feel uncomfortable doing that. And honestly, I, I just try to find more things to post or I'll post our supplies or I'll post other things to kind of make up for having to always expose someone. Because I wouldn't want to be exposed. If I'm struggling, I'm on the street. No, you may not take a picture of me, <laughs> you know, and show it to the world, so it's important to just be intentional and to be mindful of those things. So thinking about your upbringing, would you say you've had to overcome adversity? And if so, how has it shaped you and how is it shaping you? Yeah, so I never really know how to answer that question because I don't feel like I had to overcome necessarily. I just had to like navigate through the situation. But um, Growing up, we struggled a lot. Um, my mom, there are a lot of days we walked in a house where we didn't have lights on or we didn't have food in the house or no hot water um, and things of that nature. 
Um, but all of those experiences, I just feel like it, it's helped me to become resourceful um, and to be more mindful of people's situations because on the outside, you would have never known what was going on inside of our house. Um, we were always very well kept. We weren't your typical like homeless, struggling family. We didn't look that way. Our hair was always done. We always had on clean clothes. We didn't wear the same clothes every day. You know, um, we also didn't tell people what was going on in our house. So we weren't just walking around sharing things. Um, but it's been, it's caused me to be mindful of you never know what somebody is going through, you know, to be kind, to um, just be intentional about how you, how you talk to people and how you treat people. So I think it's just, it's shaped me to care just a little more, just because I know what could possibly be happening in someone's home. At this point, there are those who say that the United States is fighting two different pandemics. Mm -hmm. There's COVID-19 and racism. And I want to mention two names that I hope can serve as guideposts for your reflections. Breonna Taylor and Kamala Harris. Yeah. When you hear these names, what do you feel? What are you thinking? What do you see? What do you hope? Um, so when I hear those names, I honestly get sad. You know, I get upset. Um, I don't know much about Kamala. I'm not going to lie. I'm not into politics, but I do know who she is. Um, however, what I see about her recently is just all negative things. You know, you have your, your side where people are happy um, with the position that she's been put in um, because she's a Black woman, but then you have people who have also been trying to, to demean everything she's for or has ever done. Um, so I just get sad because <laughs> honestly, so I've had a lot of recent conversations about black women and how we're mistreated the most and how we're at the, the bottom of the totem pole. Um, actually just read a book that you should actually read. It's called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Um, and there's a whole chapter about black women and how we're treated and how, um, just how no one fights for us the way that we fight for other people. And so just hearing those names just gets me so angry because I feel like people advocate us, advocate for us for just a minute, just a few seconds, just through a post on social media. But when it comes through everyday conversation and when it comes through interactions, black women are not treated the way we should be treated. As much as we persevere through all everything that's thrown, thrown at us, as well educated as we are, as, as great as we are, you know, we're not recognized for our greatness. We're still, and even when we are, we're still, um, I feel the most mistreated people on the face of the earth. So it gets me sad, <laughs> honestly. I have two sisters, an older sister, younger sister, a mother, and <clears throat> the experiences of black women in America, I agree wholeheartedly have been underappreciated, undervalued, mm -hmm. to, to circle back to a word you used earlier about education. Mm -hmm. I heard a profound quote once and it really presented this image in my mind that helped me to really see what is, what is very possible to miss, what people don't want you to see. And the quote went like this, the health of the American nation was nursed on the bosom That's of black. black women. Yeah, I've heard that one. And it's real. <laughs> it's real. You know, like we weren't, we were out in the fields and taking care of everyone else's children while still having to take care of our own families. You know, like we did everything that needed to be done to help others um, excel. And yet we're, we're left kind of like having to, you know, um, having to lift ourselves up without anyone else's help and doing it well, might I ask, <laughs> even without the, the recognition or res respect that we deserve. So one of the reasons why I felt it very necessary and important to share at the top of our conversation, just some of the goals that you are pursuing and accomplishing and have accomplished is in part lodged in that, that 
to whatever degree, the way something is said about our black sisters, we cannot underestimate the economy of words, the tone of words. And I'm not trying to philosophize here, but in all, in all seriousness, I think there's a difference if, if for no other reason than implication between, yes, yeah, so I'm glad to have Janice Dickerson here with me. What's up, yeah. Janice? How you doing, little mama? You know, like <laughs> that that would have that would have first of all colored the conversation. You probably looked at me sideways, mm -hmm. but that would have not represented the all that is happening right now with you. So mm -hmm. words, yeah, conversation, what is said, you know, and how it's being said. So I want to now ask you, that's that's from just my perspective. N not knowing by my own personal experience what I know what it's like to grow up as a black man, black boy in America. And that's challenging, right? And so when it comes to your, your whole health or comprehensive health, that is mental, spiritual, emotional, physical, relational, in light of all that we've talked about and, and some of the other elements that we didn't talk about yet, how integral is your relationship with God in all of these things? Another way to put that is, and you can add to it. I'm, I'm coming from a faith perspective and you can add to that other, other items. Mm -hmm. What is keeping you grounded mm -hmm. in light of all that there is to be sad about, mad about? Mm -hmm. What keeps you rooted? What keeps you whole, sane, moving forward? Um, just being, just my reasoning for doing what I'm doing keeps me grounded. Um, that constant reminder of people need help um, keeps me going. Um, my, my relationship with God is crucial for me. When I first started Simply, I had a lot of um, pushback because I would serve on the Sabbath or, you know, I would, I would just do things my own way. Um, and so I had to really just pray a lot and read my Bible a lot to kind of figure out, okay, am I really doing something wrong here? And after I, you know, continue to develop my own relationship with God and to, and to um, get into scripture on my own and to kind of interpret it for myself, I recognize that, no, Jesus did stuff on the Sabbath. You know, I'm not doing anything against what he's telling me to do. I'm not, um, everything that people are telling me, it's, it's because they're uncomfortable with what I'm doing because it's not what they're used to. And that's just not necessarily because I'm doing something wrong. Um, and my, my growth and my journey with God has really um, helped me to keep pushing because it, it's caused me to just disregard everything everybody has to say um, against what I'm doing and how I'm doing it and how I should shape it and so on and so forth. Um, and it's reassured what I'm doing. It's kind of confirmed, like, you're good. Keep going. You know, this is what you're supposed to be doing. This is how God is leading you. Um, just because you're not doing it in a church setting does not take away from anything. I feel like I do more ministry on the street, you know, than I do in the church. And that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> but yeah, I my relationship with God was, and is still, but in the beginning, it was very crucial for me because I did question a lot of the things that I was doing because of what people shared with me. I heard once that people do not resist change, they resist loss. And mm -hmm. sometimes that resistance to loss can come off as hyper criticism. Mm -hmm. And so the mission that you're on with Simply Service can cause people to be very defensive, mm -hmm. especially if it seems to be a departure from what they're used to. Well, if I go here or do this, will I lose this or that? And in a very real sense, and I think you've found this peace of mind in your own pursuit of God and clarity through his word, that this is an outliving of the principles of scripture. That if Christ's ministry is liberative, if it is uplifting and edifying, if the Sabbath is a picture, a symbol of the rest we ultimately have in him, then why can't I mm -hmm. serve people, bringing rest to them yeah. where they are? Their minds to their bodies. So yeah, I think that we, sorry to interrupt. I think that rest, for me, rest, I think 
when we think of rest, we think of just laying around, not doing what we do during the week. I think that's like one of the first things that comes to our mind. Um, but you can, you can ease somebody's mind by helping them. And I feel like that's a form of bringing rest as well. Um, and it's a form of healing. Any type of healing is bringing rest <laughs> to me. And I think it's, it's important to look at all aspects of the Sabbath and all there, just all aspects of what the Sabbath means for us. Um, and what rest really means for us. And to know that it's not all about you and your rest. Sometimes you need to bring something to someone else, you know, like help someone else rest. It's not, you know, you can rest next seven. <laughs> but I also wanted to talk about, um, you talked about loss. And this is something that I actually learned in my program. So grief, grief is, it can be through anything. I think, of, I believe that people only think of grief when it comes to death. Um, but grief is literally a loss of something. Um, and resistance, and I didn't learn this until later, the resistance that comes with grief is just, it's just that, that change, you know, that, that not being comfortable and that um, not being sure, you know, that, that just comes with it. It just comes with it. And so it's important to not um, assume that people are just trying to to be mean or to, you know, kind of not want to agree with what you're doing, to just recognize that it's just not something they're used to, you know, let them get comfortable, then, then they'll be okay. <laughs> it takes time. I learned that in part while I was on a training run with my coach and for three or four weeks, we would take the same route. And mm -hmm. by the third or fourth week, I knew that route cold. Mm -hmm. I was more comfortable in conversation while running because where are we going next wasn't a question I was wrestling with. I knew we were gonna go, go right here, turn left there, be on this path for a while, and then we'd make it back to the starting point. Mm -hmm. On one particular run, however, when we got to the last right turn, he said at the last minute, let's keep going. And Janice, at that moment, <laughs> I dialed back my conversation. Mm -hmm. I was more observant of how much energy I was distributing because at that point, I didn't know what this new pathway would bring, how long are we gonna be out here? Will I be able to make it back? Yeah. In time, that new pathway that I was concerned about became comfortable. Yeah. But it was that point of departure from the norm, mm -hmm. from the predictable, emerging towards something new. Here was what it was though. It was a path he knew I was ready to take. It would add more mileage to our runs and ultimately made me stronger. Mm -hmm. And so I love that leadership principle that you just shared, sometimes for leaders, it helps to just know wherever there's resistance to change, it's grieving loss. Mm -hmm. And there's a great deal that people don't know. Yeah. We naturally crave equilibrium, predictability. It's a part of how we survive. Can you imagine if you open your front door every day and wondered whether or not there was going to be ground? Yeah. You would have far less peaceful sleep. Yeah. Some things you just can't think about. But when something new and different is introduced, and I would dare assume that if not for Simply Service, those who are listening can testify that maybe other service opportunities you were resistant about at first or someone who wanted to partner with Simply had a litany of questions and you just had to say, just come join us mm -hmm. come and all your questions will be answered. <laughs> yeah, that's real. So as a leader, mm -hmm. educated black woman in leadership, mm -hmm. you have a team around you. Do. How do you cast vision strategize, lead your team. You have relationships with your team. Um, I, I know some of them, so I know that there's some pre-existing relationships, but even, even still leadership is a challenge. Mm -hmm. What's your philosophy for leadership? How do you flow? What, what is the Janice way? <laughs> um, the Janice way is probably not a way I would tell people. Um, I wouldn't tell people to go this way. I kind of just, if I have an idea, Let's figure out how to do it. Um, let's make sure it makes sense and make sure it, and it aligns with what we're trying to do. But I'm kind of just like, all right, let's do it. Um, but I would say, I mean, my philosophy is listen to learn. Um, and that's in all aspects. When you're serving, listen to those that you're serving. Don't try to, when someone is telling you something, stop trying to figure out how to help them right then and there. Um, and your team listen to their input 
Um, that's something that I really struggled with in the beginning. I'm not going to lie. I like to be in control of everything. Um, and I like things to go my way. So just listening to input because everyone specializes in something different. Everyone has more knowledge in different areas and you can always learn. You can learn from those that you're serving. You can learn through um, stories that are being told. I've learned so much about just, just the government through stories being told. Um, and I, don't, I just think that listening is crucial and it's not something that we're intentional about. So I would say that that is my philosophy. And yeah, <laughs> I don't remember what else you asked me. <laughs> no, that, that's, that's on point. And I appreciate your transparency and your willingness to let us in to what comes natural for you and then what you are what you are learning as a leader i think it demystifies the born leader notion we all want to have it all together and as a pastor i can agree wholeheartedly you want your way done and a part of that has to do with being comfortable as a leader if you're just mm -hmm. listening to everyone and going everyone's way uh, i do believe to a great degree nothing would be done we have to make decisions but it doesn't mean that a part of our decision making process doesn't include leading. I love what you said, that other people have expertise. Mm -hmm. And I can learn from listening in ways that will enhance the efficiency of my leadership. Yeah, that's, awesome. that's something that I had to learn. And I didn't learn until I realized I was a visionary leader. Um, and I learned this in my program. Thank God I'm learning as I <laughs> pay for these classes. But um, with being a visionary leader, you have to have a team to help you execute. I know what I want to do. I know exactly what it looks like. I can tell you where everything is placed, how many, you know, what exactly everything, but I can't always execute it on my own. Also, um, I also am very, I don't want to say I'm limited in what I know, but my everybody has limited skills. And so having people on my team that are just greater in certain areas helps me to truly cast out my vision and to truly, you know, execute my plans. Um, so I think it's, it's crucial community and having people who are not just like you is crucial for growth in any way. And it's crucial for, for getting things done, honestly. So you're a visionary leader. And I think that connects with what you said earlier, where you said, I'm a dreamer. And I think yeah. the two, um, kind of go hand in hand. I dream, I can see things, I can see the final product. This is a moment now where we get a chance just to hear you dream out loud. Mm -hmm. I don't feel in any way that Simply Service is the start and end for future Dr. Dickerson, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and you can answer it maybe like this. So in my program, what they're teaching us is be able to identify your problem area, be able to articulate the ideal, how would the situation look and then if, if changed, and then how are you going to bridge that gap? How do you get from problem to ideal? So, so just kind of dream out loud for us. And it doesn't just have to be simply service. It can be whatever the postdoctoral work will produce or yeah. just for me as Janice, if it were my way, money's not an issue. Resourcing is an issue. I have all the networking that I need. I have I have the president on speed dial, whoever you need, you know, go international. I, I'm connected with the prime ministers and the queens and kings all over. What kind of changes do you want to make in the world, in this nation? You gave us a little bit about your heart is for young people, for yeah. those right now in the foster care system. But if you leave your imprint and people look back and say, that's the footprint of Janice Dickerson, where are they looking when they see that? You shouldn't have asked. I'm a dreamer, Richard. Why'd you ask me this question? I have a lot of different things. We're in the living room. We need that. Share. Um, so one, one thing that I, um, I have actually started working on is I would love to, and this is weird because I don't tell people what I like, what I want to do. So, <laughs> um, I would love to have housing for emancipated foster youth. Um, to kind of house them and put them in a program that'll teach them just basic life skills. Um, because these kids come out of foster care with no knowledge in anything. Um, they don't know how to use money at all, but they don't know how to like budget. They don't know how to grocery shop when you only have $20 for the week. 
They don't know how to apply for jobs, apply for college, you know, where to look for scholarships. Um, they don't know how to clean properly. Just things that we don't think twice about, like these kids are being put out on the street, basically having to try to figure out as they go. Um, and so one of my dreams is to have a transitional um, living program where these kids can emancipate if they want out of foster care, but there's housing for them. They won't have to rely on what they have and what they know. Um, and they're put in a program that they would have to graduate out of um, before transitioning completely on their own. Um, so that's one of my big things that, <laughs> which has kind of like guided my um, dissertation topic, obviously, because if I do this, I don't want to be the leaders out here not leading properly. You know, I really want to take the kids' needs into consideration and to apply those needs to them um, effectively. So that's one thing. Um, as far as simply, I mean, there's so many routes that I want to go with simply, but overall, I, I would love to just be able to just speak and educate people on poverty. When people think of poverty, they think of homelessness and um, just struggling. And there's so many branches of poverty that people don't talk about. Um, there's so much trauma that comes with living um, in poverty. There's they're just so <laughs> there's just so many factors that branch off of the topic of poverty that people are completely ignorant to. Um, and I do believe I obviously I'm all for education. I'm still in school. So um, I do believe that education is key to growing and to learning and to changing ways. And I don't feel like we can, I can't get people to come and to continuous, to, to con continue to volunteer with Simply and to really have a heart for what I'm doing if they don't know why, if they don't know the ins and outs of what we're really working with and what people on the street are, street are really dealing with. So just educating and really and really just lighting fires in people to understand why this is an issue, why it needs to be talked about, and why we need to like go ahead and try to fix some things for people. You mentioned that your PhD program is organizational leadership, yeah. and you shared with us a bit of what you are researching. Angela Duckworth is a psychologist who wrote a book I read and love. It's called Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. In that book, she introduces a concept called doing the hard thing. Mm -hmm. And it is founded upon this idea that people can grow the growth mindset or grow the fixed mindset. Fixed mindset is I am who I am. This is what it is. It won't change. And that can be about yourself or about the very arenas in which you're seeking to bring change. Mm -hmm. You're talking to a person and they just say, ah, it's been like that for decades, a thousand years. You mm -hmm. know, who do you think you are to change it? Fixed mindset. Then there are others like yourself who have that growth mindset and the growth mindset can be nurtured wherever you find yourself. And it's not always linear, you know, wherever you find yourself in your life and you might have a fixed mindset in this area of growth, you can grow. The doing the hard thing is this. It's something that her family does every year where they have to choose a hard thing, something that they don't, it doesn't come natural to them. And the, the whole thing is I've got to stick with it and see it through. So I, one of your hard things is you're pursuing a PhD. That's hard. That takes work. <laughs> <laughs> it takes time. Yes. But is there another hard thing that you are doing right now that you're like, this is difficult, but it's going to be a game changer. And it can be about yourself. It can be in some other area. So I would say the hard thing for me right now is to be about what I talk about um, as far as just educating people on poverty. And I'm, I'm always talking about or trying to correct people on um, just their biases when it comes to poverty and homelessness and stuff. Um, but to truly be about that change, like to actually go out and do something that's really making a change and to not talk about it all the time. I read a, the book I read, The Crossing and Lynching Tree, it had this philosopher, his name was Niebuhr, I can't remember his first name. Um, but throughout the book, he, they emphasized the fact that he was, he talked about black people and the problems and the struggles that come with us um, and that we have to endure. But he never, when it came to actually signing a paper to make a change, or when it came to um, speaking 
somewhere specifically, maybe like to a primarily white crowd or something, he was not willing to do so. Um, and for me, I was just like, wow, like we do a lot of time, we do a lot of talking, just as people, we do a lot of talking, we do a lot of um, telling people what they need to do and um, bringing about ideas of, oh, this would be, this would make the world better, but we don't actually put forth the work to make that change. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, so I get why people don't, but I don't want to just talk about it. I don't. Um, and I, this is gonna take a while for me to work on because I've been noticing that like when something is, no one tells you how much work something is, something like this is, you know? No one tells you how, no one told me how much work this PhD was. And then you get in it and you're like, abort, abort vision, I don't wanna do it anymore, you know? So um, just being about what I talk about. That's, that's that hard thing for me. Getting out of my comfort zone is primarily why it's hard. I have a very small bubble. <laughs> and so getting out of it is completely uncomfortable for me. But in order for me to grow and in order for change to be made, it has to happen. Well, it's clear to me, and I'm sure clear to those who are listening, that you are not only discovering and developing your voice, mm -hmm. but you are gaining your footing and you are talking the talk and walking the walk. Share with listeners both how they can follow you and Simply Service, direct them to Instagram or the website or both if you want to. And I have one more question after you do that. Okay. Um, so you can follow Simply Service on Instagram and Facebook at Simply Service Inc. Remember, it's an I, not a Y. Um, and you can follow me on Instagram at Jeannie K, J E A N N E K A Y Y. Awesome. Um, yeah. Also, how can people support and help? Will they be able to find out what they can do to support Simply Service at those locations? Yeah, so, I mean, we're always taking donations. Um, we just made a new program, developed a new program where we're paying for bills for families right now. Um, COVID has really made life harder for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people are losing their jobs and they're just not able to just pay the necessary bills to you know keep pushing. Um, and groceries. People are not, they're struggling with trying to figure out what they're going to eat for the month. So we're paying bills and groceries, so donations are needed for that. Um, and we're always making blessing bags, always making blessing bags. I Lately, I've been donating a lot to other organizations that go out as well, um, especially if they go out more frequently, because I don't want to stop serving. I also am trying to build community and build relationships with other organizations, especially those with the same goal in mind, because I can't do it on my own. As much as I would love to say that I can, I can't, and it's crucial to partner with others. So um, we've been donating supplies to organizations that may need it. So donations are always um, welcome. Sharing posts, that's that's big for me. Um, that's always welcome as well. Those would be probably the two biggest ways to support. All right. You heard it here, my brothers and sisters. Donate, share, connect, partner. You've heard she's been kind enough to dream a little with us out loud. Um, yeah. <laughs> we appreciate that and we value that. And I want you to continue dreaming and continue to cast vision and lead through resistance. Continue to be the change agent that you are. Here is our final question. You can send a text message to yourself 10 years into the future. What does it say? My text message was say um, to just keep pushing and stop doubting yourself. Um, I have a bad habit that I just recognized not too long ago that I kind of diminish my abilities and um, just my knowledge in certain areas and just what I'm capable of doing. Um, and it stops me from pursuing certain things. And honestly, when I, when I finally decide to pursue those things, I realize, oh, you can do it. <laughs> if you just didn't doubt yourself in the first place, you know, have more confidence in what you're capable of. Um, and knowing that failure will occur, but it is okay. Um, that's also something that I'd probably put in a text. I don't do well with failing. <laughs> um, so I don't like to accept failure. Um, and so that's something that, you know, stops me from just growing and doing things. 
I'm smiling. I'm just, I love it. I'm grateful that you were willing to have this conversation and share and sensitize us to the powerfully transformative results of service, of coming out of oneself to uplift other people. What is your estimated time of graduation? So pray for me, you guys. I want to graduate next year. Next May, I want to be done. I don't know if I have any more in me. Um, next summer at the latest is when, and I can be done. I just have to put in the work <laughs> to finish my dissertation. That's what it all comes down to, um, to work on my dissertation while I'm still in classes. So next year, I, I plan on announcing that I have graduated with a PhD in organizational leadership. Well, I can see it already. I can see <laughs> the velvet hood, the blue, your yes. three stripes. And I will say she was in the living room first. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome. In advance, congratulations. Hey, listen, everybody, go follow Janice Dickerson and send her some love. Let her know you're doing well. Finish strong. Pump her up. Let her know that she's making a huge difference. We appreciate you and we thank you for being here. Well, I know that you are glad that you came to the living room today. We have listened and we have learned and we're going to live based on what we have learned. That's all we have for you today. I'm your host, Richard Martin. Our special guest has been Janice Dickerson. We thank you for joining us in the living room and we'll see you next time.